Well, I want to welcome all of you and so glad that you've joined us. We are in a series that I have titled, The Divine Reset. The Divine Reset. This is part three. Now, I want, I want to just begin by recapping, giving you a few thoughts and summarizing where we're at in this series uh, it is my deep conviction that God desires to do something very new and fresh in each of us, which really is His church in America and around the globe. I believe that. Did you notice the video talked about the universal church? You, you understand, we're just a congregation which is a part of the universal church. We're, it's not just, hey, the church on the rock or church, the, the church of... Uh, Church on the Rock, whatever. Some people call it Church on the Rocks. We're a part of the overall picture is what the preacher's trying to say. I really believe that it is a new hour in God's timetable. And I'll tell you one of the reasons I believe that is by all the signs that I'm seeing that Jesus spoke of in Matthew 24, uh, the Apostle Paul spoke of in uh, Timothy, but... More than anything, is because of what's going on in the state of Israel. Folks, listen to me. I can't go into all of it. God, uh, Israel is still the apple of God's eye. God created that nation. He made a covenant with them. And He will uphold that covenant. Amen. And they are still very special to Him. So be, be careful what you buy into. And don't you ever, as a Christian, get one of those signs and protest against Israel in favor of a, a, a terrorist organization. Don't you do that. Shame on. The challenge in this divine reset is, can God get the cooperation of His children? I mean, you know, that, of Christians. That, that's always God's challenge. God has never stopped moving. God would love to break out in revival and an awakening in this nation. It's never on God's side. It's can God get His children to cooperate with Him? Amen. This has always been the challenge. Can He get us to the place where we are willing as Christians to reevaluate our walk with Him and how we live out our faith and, 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 and how does that compare to what the Bible says? It's a challenge. How many of you know they say the one constant is change? But how many of you know we don't do change well? Christians do not do change well. We lie. We, and listen, I'm a very routine person. Uh, uh, listen, for the last three months, my routine has just been scrambled. But I'm, I'm telling you, I'm going to get it back. <laughs> a little curveball thrown our way there. But I'm getting it back. I shared with you, by the way, the one constant is change. It's, 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 don't, how many of you just say, I just wish things would just calm down and just go with the flow. It'll never be that way. Not till we get to heaven, thank God, when we get to heaven. I shared with you in the last two messages how I believe, and I mean this, I want you to know this, that God wants every one of you to be a part of this great divine reset. In fact, I believe he's calling people that got out of church. They've, they've grown cold toward God and the things of God. They got bitter, angry, whatever, uh, confused. God's calling people. And if you feel the call of God and you sense it, I would urge you to get in on it now. Because when God starts calling, folks, we better start responding. Amen? Amen. I also stated that it doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. If you want to be a part of this great divine reset, you can be. Now, I spent the first two messages in this series talking about this. How, how do we get in on this divine reset? Number one, you've you got to know God. Step number one, and I talked about this uh, last time, uh, you've got to give your heart and your life to Jesus Christ and allow Him to be the Lord of your life. Now, nobody said you're, you're going to live perfectly every day, because nobody does. But you're going to be striving to do better and better every day. You're going to learn what it means to be a disciple. You've given your heart to Him. And if somewhere along the way you breathe your last breath, I mean you go straight into heaven. Glory to God. Amen. What's the second step? We talked about it. We are to follow Christ 
in uh, water baptism. I mean, you know, Jesus set the example. Now, now you understand that Jesus is God in human form when he came here. He, he put on a human suit. God. Think about that. If that ever becomes real to you, God said, I want to go down, and I, I don't want to just create humans. I want to go down. I want to know exactly what they go through on a daily basis, how they get weary of the mama and all that she goes through raising the children, the man trying to provide, and all the things that they go through, marital issues, all the problems that people go through. I want to go down, and I want to live in this human flesh, what it means to get tired and weary and, and want to give up, have people uh, unjustly hate you, lie about you, I want to experience it all so that when they come to me in prayer, as Hebrews says, as the great high priest, I can relate to them. Your Savior can relate to you. But how many of you know he was God in flesh? But, but he, he, what did he do next? He was water baptized. Now, we believe in immersion here. Why? Because immersion is a picture of the grave. We are symbolizing, as Christ did, he died and went into that grave, and it says he rose again, victorious over death, hell, and the grave. Why do we immerse here under water? First of all, it's biblical. The words that used for water baptism speak of that. But we do it because it symbolizes the burial, the death of the old person. When I was water baptized, we buried the old David. I, according to 2 Chronicles 7, uh, 5, 17, I believe it is, I became a new creation on the inside. And we symbolically bury the old person so that we don't, have to, we don't have to follow that old person anymore. I mean, you know, that old person wants us to follow him. The devil will give you a lot of creative ways to follow him, try to justify it too today. I, I tell you, I, I hear things all the time and I'm like, where'd you get that from? I can tell you where they get it from, the devil. Jesus said, anyone who believes in me and is baptized or immersed will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from the corruption of sin. Saved from those things that, that tend to uh, uh, keep you down. Saved from an eternity in hell. But anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. They get, they get all that and more. Someone I know and I love, and we have these talks from time to time, they, they, they really believe, and I, I get what they're saying, but they really believe uh, this life might be hell. Because they've gone through a really lot of hard Hardship, really hard stuff. I told him, man, this ain't nothing like the real hell. And don't you believe for a moment that this is hell and this is the extent of it. And when you die, that's it. This, this ain't hell, folks. So, if you want to go to heaven, you want the benefits of God, you want to be saved from all these things, then you've got to give your heart to Jesus and then be water baptized. We've got to sign up out there. We're going to be baptizing people real soon again. And if you want to be in on it, uh, I encourage you to put your name on that list. But we'll, we'll have a date together real soon. But how many of you know there is a third thing, or a third step, if you will, I've got a lot of steps here, that you'll need to take if you are going to be a part of this reset. Did you know that? Well, there is. You will need God's power released in you. You're going to need God's power. Now, folks, God never intended for Christians to function, uh, you know, without His power. I, I, I tell you, we're making a comeback in the church, but it's taken us a long time. You will need God's power released in your life. The Bible calls this the baptism with the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible calls it. Now we must have God's power or, if you will, the baptism with the Holy Spirit if we want to live a victorious life. I don't know about you, but I, I hate defeat and, and, and problems all the time. I want to live victorious over the things of this life. If you, if you want to have power and ability, which you should if you're a believer, and you've got the real thing, you're a real Christian, you want others to know about it. But how I many you know, that's kind of intimidating in your own strength. You've got to have God's power. And how many of you know you need God's power for serving? You know the reason there's so many unfulfilled Christians today? They don't have His power. 
The Bible says in the last days people will turn away from the Holy Spirit. Who could make them holy and who could empower them? Don't you turn the Holy Spirit away in this hour. You need Him more now than you ever did before. But you know, it's not being preached very much today because, well, it might hurt. You know, it's always about we might, we might, we might offend someone. When did the church get so darn weak that we got so concerned, so obsessed over telling the truth versus people getting offended? I'm beginning to wonder if it's not narcissism in the preachers. We just can't afford to lose a crowd. Because if we lose a crowd, then we lose money to pay for our temples. Get your temple paid for and you don't have to worry about it. That's a novel idea, isn't it? Get your temple paid for. You don't have to worry about paying for it. Amen. I think I probably should move on. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now that word power in the Greek is the Greek word dunamis. It's the word we get in, in our English language for dynamite. <laughs> Woo! We need some dynamite power in the church. And if the church will get back to these things. When I came into the faith, the churches God led me to, they understood these things. And he says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The primary purpose for the church, once you're born again, is to go out under the power of God. I don't care if you're a plumber, whatever, electrician, whatever you do, you're, you're into technology. Whatever you do while you do that, that is to pay for your ministry. You are to go out and help as many of God's created children come to know Him so that when their time is up, they can go to heaven, plus live a more fulfilled life. So what is the next step that you do regarding this truth? Step number one, you ask your heavenly Father, and that's who you're asking, for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to be in Luke 11 uh, quite a bit this morning, so if you want to turn to Luke 11, you might want to do some marking in your Bible. But Luke 11, verse 13, Jesus is saying, If you then, being evil, he just, He's just talking to us humans. We do have a few evil tendencies. Hello, look around. He says, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who, what? who ask Him? Amen. If you ask God to fill you up with the Holy Spirit and give you the Holy Spirit, guess what? He is delighted to do it. You are not inconveniencing Him. By the way, I love to still hear pages turning in a Bible. I hear a lot of pages turning. I don't hear any buttons clicking, but I'm sure they are. Luke 11. Now, I, I want to make something very clear here. When you become a Christian, a Christ follower, the day you say, this is the day I give my heart to Jesus Christ to be my Lord and be my Savior, I repent of my sins, the indwelling Holy Spirit comes and your spirit is born again. You may not know this, you, ha you have a spirit. And until you're born again, because of what happened in that garden, your spirit is dead. It's dark. And it needs to be born again. When you invite Christ in, He comes and He indwells your spirit. You are born again. And if you died tomorrow, uh, or, or, or two minutes after you prayed that prayer, you'd go straight to heaven. So you, if you are a Christian, every one of you, you're the real deal. You're not playing a game. Uh, some of these fake Christians... Uh, you're real. And you've asked Christ. He, he's in you right now. As you sit here and you listen. He is in your heart. You have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Everybody got that? Amen. Now, this happened to the uh, 12 apostles in John 20 and 20. Christ had resurrected that Sunday morning, that Sunday evening. He meets with them and he says to them, How many you know you cannot be born again until Christ has experienced death, burial, and resurrection? You cannot. And what does he do? Jesus comes and he gathers with his disciples and it says he, <sighs> he breathed on them. You know what happened to the disciples at that very moment? 
The same thing that happens to a believer when they say, Jesus, come into my heart. They received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. They became Christ followers. They, they were born again. So when you talk about asking the Father, the Heavenly Father for the Holy Spirit. In other words, here's what you're doing, uh, which is a part of the next step. You invite the Holy Spirit to have full access to your life. Again, I want you to get this. The Bible calls this the baptism with the Holy Spirit. The baptism. In other words, if you want a picture, when you're water baptized, you go under the water, you're baptized, you're completely immersed in that water. What happens to you when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? I mean, He starts flowing out of you, and He immerses every part of your being. And when He starts baptizing you, He starts cutting you from that old stuff. He goes into your brain and moves around there in your brain, starts cutting all that negative stuff off and, and those addictions and all that. I tell you, people need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm all for programs that help people be overcomers, but dear God, if we bypass this, and churches everywhere are bypassing this now. Just don't want to deal with it. John said this of Jesus. He said this in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. He said, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. That was John's method to get you ready for uh, Christ's coming. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Woo! So when Jesus came, John said, here's what he's going to do. I'm baptizing you in water to get you ready for Christ the coming Messiah, what he's going to do when he comes, after he does all he's going to do, then he's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. By the way, that fire, don't be afraid of the fire. The fire just represents cleansing. Some of you are crying, Oh God, deliver me! Set me free! Receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit and that fire will start burning away all those bad ideas. That some, of you, some of you got some weird thinking. Everybody, eh, nobody likes me. Nobody loves me. That's in your head. Amen. And you're living that out and people don't like you because you're weird. You act weird around them. And you, you why are y'all rejecting me? Why, why is that? That's in your head. Let the Holy Spirit fill you. I like, to, I like to look at it this way. He says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Out of your spirit. Let the Holy Spirit fill you and flush all that garbage out. Boom! Ooh. <clears throat> I'm a little excited today. By the way, how many of you know what I'm talking to you about is what the disciples of Jesus received on the day of Pentecost. Keep in mind, they already have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but now they need power. And he told them, don't you go do my business until, Acts 1 and 8, until you've received that power. Acts 2, verses 1 through 4, it says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. I like that. I always notice now where they were sitting. It's not always... It, never mind, I'm going to leave that one. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. Again, the symbol of fire represents the Holy Spirit. And that perpetual fire that helps you and encourages you and, 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 and motivates you. And it says, Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of a fire, and it set on each of them. And they were all filled or baptized with the Holy Spirit. And what they do? They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. By the way, how many of you know, when you go all the way through the book of Acts, you start with the apostles. In fact, I'm going to show you in just a moment, we go a little further back than that. But this is the pattern you see throughout uh, the 12 apostles, all through the book of Acts. By the way, I don't know if you know this, there were seven different occasions where people were baptized with the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. Some of them more than once. Just thought I'd whet your appetite there. So this is the pattern that you see all the way through the book of Acts. Acts 8 in Samaria. Acts 9, I'll, I'll talk a little more about this, uh, when Saul, who was Paul, was converted and received the Holy Spirit. Baptism. Acts 10. 
when the Gentiles came into the faith. Acts 19 in Ephesus. So here, here's the pattern I want you to see. And you, you, can, you can see this all through the life of Jesus and all through the book of Acts. Here it is, water, uh, a salvation. You come to Christ. I did that a lot of years ago. Thank God. Then I was water baptized. Just a few miles out here in a place that used to be called Maranatha Retreat Center. That's where Trace and I were married. That, in fact, that's where I met Christ. That's where I was water baptized. And that's where I met the love of my life. Yeah. Snug up on her. She was warned. All the gossips in town warned her, don't, don't, don't. And she did it. Boy, didn't she do pretty good. <laughs> Again, do you want an example? Because I know I've got some people probably watching this. They're just analyzing this. You know, religious people overanalyze things. They, 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 they listen to you not to learn. They listen to you to prove you wrong. Well, good luck. I mean, you know, Jesus is our example. You remember I talked to you a little earlier how Christ came. We call it the incarnation. He came and he put on this human suit. He became like us, but he was God and he was human. What did Jesus do? He came to John. He said, John, baptize me. He was baptized. What happened to Jesus when Jesus came up out of the watery grave? What happened? The Holy Spirit came upon him and he was baptized in and with the Holy Spirit. And what did he do? He went out into the wilderness, spent some time with God and defeat the devil for us. you got to do the same thing. Oh, you want to be in on my next part of this series. I guarantee you, you don't want to miss that one. And what did Jesus do? He came out of that wilderness in the power of the Holy Spirit. Folks, this is a pattern all through the Bible. You've got Jesus Jesus needed the baptism with the Holy Spirit to function and do what God sent him to this earth to do and what he came here to do. Don't, don't you think if Jesus needed it, we do? Where do these dumb preachers, I'm sorry, where do they get this idea that, that there's no... Don't even waste your breath, preacher. You got Jesus? Forgive me, Lord, for calling them dumb. They're ignorant. You know what ignorant means, uninformed. So we got Jesus, got the example of Jesus. Water baptism, baptism in the Holy Spirit. Got the original 12, they received Christ, the indwelling. Then they received an Acts there, baptism of the Holy Spirit. So the pattern is this, you come to Christ, you're water baptized, and then you receive baptism with the Holy Spirit. This is the pattern. So that brings me to step number two. Here's what you need to do. You need to expect to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit when you ask for it. Again, Luke eleven thirteen 13 says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts. And I'm reading the uh, Amplified Version here. It says, Gifts that are to their advantage to your children. How much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask and continue to ask Him? God delights in giving us. Folks, I want to tell you something about God. God is not... A pushy God. He's very gentle and very kind. He doesn't push anything on us. You do not have to receive this. In fact, let me, let me, let me go ahead and just say to every one of you, you are welcome here. This is not some pet doctrine of church on the rock or some denomination that we're a part of. This is the Bible. I don't preach denomination. I'm affiliated with a group of preachers, but we're not a denomination in the sense that I've got to preach the denominational messages. I preach the Bible. And it says that God delights to give the Holy Spirit to those who ask it of Him. Now let me read this to you. When an honest, hungry seeker asks for the baptism of the Holy Spirit... He or she, you got to be correct here, I'm afraid to mess up, you know. All of us need not fear receiving less than God's promise. You know what you got to do? Sometimes people, when they hear this stuff, they just get so uptight. Just relax. Chill. 
You see, it's not necessary for us to work up some emotion or one's emotions. A simple yielding to God and taking the time to vocalize the wonderful works of God will give you the answer. The Holy Spirit, are you listening, is not received after many years of struggle trying to live for God. Are you listening? God wants you to receive the Holy Spirit at the beginning of your Christian walk. I love people. I've got friends. I've known people. Well, I, 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 I gave up. I, gave, I, I prayed for 30 years, and I never received it. Why not? I don't know. I guess God didn't want me to have it. Wrong. He not only knows you need it, He delights in giving it to you. So step number three. Here, here's the reason some people don't receive it. Uh, number three, no need to fear. Some people you just talk about these things. I'm, I've decided I'm going to talk about it. 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 As I'm led to do so. You don't, you don't have to fear. Listen again to Luke 11, verses 11 through 12. It says, you fathers, if your children ask you for a fish, in other words, something you need, you need some food. Uh, do you give them a snake instead? No, I'd get out my little single shot 410, you hand it to me, and I'm pew, and hope your hands are out of the way when you hand it to me. No. Instead... Verse 12, or if they ask for an egg, provision, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. Jesus is trying to say how ridiculous that even you fathers who are evil, y'all mess up all the time, you're not going to give something bad to your kids when they ask for it, are you? Jesus would never allow something bad or evil to come into your life when you come to him as a sincere seeker. This is not going to happen. You know where this fear comes from? Ultimately, it comes from the devil. He's the one that has put fear in the heart of many believers. Because he knows if you ever get this power, and you ever get some other things that come with that, he's doomed. He's lost influence with you. He can't depress you anymore. He can't keep you so defeated. You won't witness. You won't do anything. You won't serve in the church. You won't go to connect group. He knows if I can keep them down where they don't have any power, I can just every now and then drop by and just... Not, knock them down a little bit. Depress them. Oh, you're you, you going to try to move for Jesus? Let me... A little depression. By the way, this week I heard, and it's fact, 50% of Christians in America do not believe in a devil. 50%. No wonder the devil's able to run all over this nation. My God, if you don't believe in a devil, why go vote? Why care about anything? 50%. I'm telling you, we got, a lot of, we got a lot of folks in America that's calling themselves Christians. They ain't Christians. I'm going to address that issue in the next portion of this series. He knows how desperately that we as followers of Christ need this power. He knows that it is the key to victorious living, living a life of freedom, and fulfilling our service for Jesus. You want fulfillment? Listen, life's hard. Let's, let's admit it. Life's hard. There's always challenges. But if you want fulfillment, you want joy, start serving Christ. Find a place in your church and start serving. Amen. And step number four, you need to know that this promise is for you and for your children. Listen to Acts 2, 38 through 39. It says, Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Hear the pattern? Repent. Come to Christ. Repent. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And what? And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, you've got to understand, Peter is, this is in the context of, of, of Pentecost. It's just happened. There's people all around heard this great noise and they hear them speaking in tongues and other things and they come running to see what this phenomenon is and, and Peter lets them know, you want in on this? Here's what you got to do. You got to come to Christ. You need water baptism and then you'll receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Listen to verse 39. He says, for this promise is to you 
And your children, keep in mind, he is addressing an audience of people. This is for you, people. And this is for your children. And listen, and all who are far off, as many as the Lord God will call to himself. Is Christ still calling people to himself? So guess what? This promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for you and you need it. Amen. You need it. I hope you're convinced. But if not, I'm, st- I'm going to help you. I've got some resources for you. And I'm going to do some other series on Wednesday night that I think will help. But now we come to, to a very interesting part of this. Get ready. Step number five, you need to yield to your new prayer language. Amen. I don't believe in that, Pastor. Just just chill out a little bit. By the way, I don't know if I said this earlier. We're not going to go around. um, If you're going to be a part of the church, say, you got the Holy Ghost. Do you speak in tongues? You're never going to hear us do that. Not from me. Not from any of the leaders that I know in this church. Now, if you ask and inquire, we might help you. We will help you. So this is not a prerequisite to be a part of church online. Unless, let me qualify, unless you are in primary leadership here. If you're in primary leadership, we want you born again. Don't you think that's a good thing? We want you water baptized. And we want you baptized in the Holy Ghost with your prayer language. So in the future, if you want to be a primary leader here, those are the qualifications. Plus, you've got to have some character in your life. Yeah, we've got to throw that in there. You know, you can speak in tongues and not have an ounce of character. Whew. Just live like the devil while you're speaking in tongues. That's what confuses some people. They don't understand how you can speak in tongues and still do awful things because you still have that flesh. People are getting nervous right now. I can sense it. Some of you are... Don't be nervous. Acts chapter 2 verse 4 says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and what? Began to speak with other tongues. Are there spiritual languages? Does the word tongues bother you? Just call it the prayer language. As the Spirit gave them utterance. Acts chapter 10 verses 44 through 48. Listen now, we're seeing a pattern here. And Peter was praying for uh, the Gentiles. By the way, they had already received Christ. They received the word of the Lord. And the Holy Spirit fell on them, uh, on all who heard. And what they did, they began to speak with other tongues and magnify God. I I can almost sense some people. "Mm, I don't know about this preacher. Well, let me read one more and then I'm going to make a comment or two. Acts 19 and verse 6. It says, And when Paul had laid hands on them, sometimes you just need somebody to lay hands on you, uh, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they did what? They spoke in tongues and prophesied. This other group was magnifying God and speaking in tongues. These people are prophesying. I mean, you've got to twist people's arms. Can somebody just prophesy today? Please. Not, we, we've got services for that. Our leadership team can. But, but did you notice that, that all, and, and, and these three occasions, all of them, it says, all of them did this. And then Paul, of course, in 1 Corinthians 14, doesn't mention it in Acts there, but in 1 Corinthians 14 and 18, says, uh, Paul said, uh, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than you all. That sounds a little arrogant, doesn't it? <laughs> Paul's saying, I speak in tongues a lot. I doubt that I speak in tongues as much as Paul, but I speak in tongues a lot. Any of you ever get up some morning and say, I know, uh, I know the Lord wants me to pray, and I know the preacher, he's been after us to go out and pray, and you go out there and pray, and uh, hello, Father, how are you? And you just go flat. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. You know what I do? I start praying in tongues. Ooh, and then I start coming alive. Mm. Some of you say, now watch it. You got to be careful of everything you do. I, I'm just up here having fun. Somebody say, am I going to start... Am I going to start jerking and popping like that? No! The preacher's just having fun. (sighs) 
Why the spiritual language or the prayer language? Number one, because it's biblical. Folks, listen, I love you. And I've been, I've been, I've been, it's biblical. The devil has done a number and told us these things passed away. Did the Great Commission pass away? Hold on, hold on before you say it. Some of you need, to, you need to open your heart. All I'm doing is trying to help you. This is your, just your choice. Why the spiritual language? Because it's biblical. Remember on the day of Pentecost, or the day the church was born, everyone received this resource. And here, here's the primary purpose for your prayer language, for worship and prayer. When you're spending time with God, that is the primary reason for it. Not to put on a show that we've all seen in days past in churches and people doing their dumb stuff. That's not what it's primarily for. It's for, it's for your worship of God, your private devotion. And it says, and at the same time, they receive the fullness of the power for service and for witness. And the Bible says it's for all who come to Him. People still come into Christ. Here's another reason, because it's beneficial. Praying in tongues or praying with your spiritual language. By the way, it is your spirit man that's trying to pray. I better say this before I forget it. So, you know, some people are offended. That, literally, they get offended when you talk about this. Their intellect gets offended because they can't figure it out. You know when our intellect gets offended? you know what really is going on? Pride. You mean I can't be in control of everything? No. Why don't you back up and let your Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God in you, let Him have control for a change? I don't know about that. Well, you still got pride. Because I can tell you, Jesus said, if you're going to come to me, you got to come as a little child. And praying with your prayer language requires you to become like a little child. Some of you need to get offended at your being offended. And you need to recognize it for what it is. It's pride and it's intellect. The intellect is good, but when the intellect gets in the way of the Bible, we got a problem. And the church in America has a problem. We are praying, God, send us a heaven-sent revival. God, send us an awakening. And we don't have enough power and the gifts of God operating in us that we could sustain a revival. It's all right, I can get excited. Serious. If we're going to have these things, and it looks like to me we need it. <laughs> I'm thinking we need it. Then guess what? The churches. And that includes every denomination that doesn't believe in it. Hello? It's beneficial. Listen, listen to Jude 20. It says, But you, beloved, building yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. It builds you up. Who, for God's sake, doesn't want to be built up today? I get up some days, or, or, or end my day, and think, Dear God, I can't wait till I get this sleep over so I can get up and get in contact with God again and start praying and praying in my spiritual language to get built up. Any of you ever have those days where I'd be glad when this one's over? Whew. 1 Corinthians 14 and 4 says, He who speaks uh, in a tongue edifies himself. Well, now, brother, it shouldn't be all about us. Well, why not? God wants us to be victorious. You know, if I get up everywhere I go, I am go down to Walmart and you're mad at everybody. Get out of my parking spot. You got the last roll of toilet paper, buddy. How about that stupid nonsense? We went and bought toilet paper, by the way. <laughs> by the way, the toilet paper is safe in America. It's made in the U.S. of A. Some of you know my testimony when I went to Cuba and all of a sudden we came back where we had a little internet service and, and the shelves were empty and there was no toilet paper. I brought Cuban government-owned Cuban toilet paper homes. So I'd have some toilet paper when I came back to America. For real. Stuffed my suitcase full of it. Cuba's got toilet paper and America doesn't. Yeah, what does this have to do with this not a 
thing. So when you read these verses, folks, the spiritual language is, is clearly beneficial. And it is to be desired, received, and exercised. Here's another reason. Because it assists, or if you will, broadens uh, your prayer life. Listen to Romans 8 and 26. He says, likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. He's going to tell us what it is. For we do not know uh, what we should pray for as we ought to, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. In other words, the Spirit of God prays through us. We need some help. I don't know about you. I need help a lot of days. And the Spirit of God, if you'll let Him, He'll pray with you. And He knows what you need. You think you know what you need. You think you need a million dollars. I do, but I don't know about you. That was funny. <laughs> we, we just think we know. I, you know, I, I got I to gotta, I, I, I gotta figure everything out into it. I'm, I'm, I'm just that way. Well, get over it. Thank God for intellect. I'm, I'm just as uh, uh, geared like a man as anybody else. I, I mean, I've got a one-track mind. Ask my wife. <laughs> Baby, I'm focused on this. Can, can you just wait? You women can multitask. God bless you. We can't. That's the reason we got married, for somebody to help us with these other areas that we struggle with. So the Holy Spirit will help you. Don't let that part where it says, you know, uh, the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. It, it, listen, if we had time, we could go back and study every Greek word. Some of you are like, you're, some of you are like I'm going to be in the middle of Walmart and all of a sudden just start, oh. That's what people really are afraid of this stuff. And some of these preachers who have done it, God, God bless them. Folks, none of these things that I'm talking to you, there is no evidence, biblically or historically, that any of these things passed away. Shh. Show it to me. But you better have your facts together when you come to show me. Because I'm going to show you context. I've been studying this for 45 years. I know what I'm talking about. And there's nowhere historically where it passed away. We, we've had this going on all through time. Now, it, it, the light got dim at different times. I mean, we had a resurgence in the 19, early 1900s. God's been trying to get us there the whole time. But, you know, things are going bad in America. So let's put all this Holy Spirit stuff behind. Let's don't do that. No, what, why? No, God wants us to be the church. Here, here's another reason. I'm almost finished. Just, just stay with me. Thank you, Lynn. Because it's a blessing. Folks, praying with your prayer language, your spiritual language, or tongues as the King James calls it, is a blessing. I'm not a, I'm not a crazy man. I'm not a man that's messed up in my head about these things. I know from experience, what it does for you. Listen to Mark 16, verse 17. Now, I want you to think of this in the context of believers. Are you? I'm going to go ahead and ask you. All right, don't raise your hand. Are you a believer in Christ? I, I didn't ask, are you Baptist? I didn't ask if you were Methodist, Presbyterian. I didn't ask any of that Pentecostal. I didn't ask any of that. Are you a believer? By the way, how many of you know there ain't going to be no charismatics in heaven, no Pentecostals, no Presbyterians, and uh, none of this other stuff? Nothing for, I, I, mm, first this, first that. I thought about one time to put, you know, we're the oldest church on the rock. I thought, we just need to put the word first up there, first church on the rock. And I thought, wouldn't that be arrogant? Are you ready? It's a blessing. It's not a curse. Mark 16, verse 17 says, And these signs will follow those who believe. If you are a believer, I'm going to give you a few signs that should be following you. And if they're not, figure out why. He says, In my name they will cast out demons. A lot of demons need to be cast out today, but the devil's labeling it everything but a devil. And a victim. And here's the second thing. It says, and they will speak with new tongues. They'll have a prayer language. Believers. These are signs that are to follow you. 
All right, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to really start trying to wrap this up. Don't, folks, don't, don't be afraid of the prayer language. Don't be afraid of it. We're not going to push anything on you. If I had time, I'd tell you a joke, but I don't have time. You're not going to be looked down on here. By the way, it's, it's a very liberating thing to do, to speak and to sing in the Spirit. Listen to 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15. It says, And what is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. So both. you got both, the understanding and the Spirit. And I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. Now this verse makes it clear that you and I must exercise our will. In other words, uh, it is our choice. You, you've got to choose to do this. And how many of you know that you cannot speak with your prayer language and speak in whatever your native tongue is, English, Spanish, Italian, whatever, you can't do it. So it's kind of a decision once you've received the Holy Spirit, right? Right? And by the way, let me, let me just tell you this, and I don't have time to read all this. I wish I did. But, but, but how, many of you know, how many of you know when little children are born and they start trying to talk, and boy, the daddy's so proud when they discover who dad is. I mean, their first word, mama, dad, dad. Boy, isn't it endearing? Let me tell you, when you start praying with your spirit, don't underestimate what you're praying. It may be just a few syllables, but you may be endearing yourself to God like you never had before. And it will develop over the years. And it will broaden. Some of you may want to just begin your experience by, by singing in tongues. If you're a singer. But here's the reality. Once you ask God to baptize you with the Holy Spirit, you receive it by faith. How many of you know it's not by feelings? Everything we receive from Christ is by faith. Do you feel something every time you... Uh, uh, Pray for it. I don't feel something, well, I was going to say I don't feel something every time I pray for Tracy, but I do. I do feel emotions for Tracy. But maybe when I pray for some of you, oh, I'm, I'm about to get in trouble. <laughs> when I pray for my parking spot at Walmart, I don't always feel something. <clears throat> well, maybe I do, but it's not the Spirit. Right? You know, I can see them in the back. They're like, where is he at? Where is he at? I'm, I'm about four pages over, guy. We're ready. We're, we're ready. I want you to keep in mind, everybody, what, what we are requesting here is a biblical request. It's something your father yearns to give to you. You say, well, why, why did he do it that way? Why do we go through all these stages? You'll have to ask him when you get to heaven. Why does God do a lot of things He does? Why does God allow this? And why does God allow that? Why, 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 why? Because He's God. And I don't know why. Can you get it all in one deal? Probably. Very few in the Bible did, but that's okay if you got it all. You got, the bab you got born again, water baptism. Uh, and, and you received the Holy Spirit. You got your prayer language. I don't care what order you get it in. My sister-in-law, Nancy, who couldn't be here this Sunday, we were having a baptism service out at Maranatha Christian Retreat Center. A bunch of us had been born again. God was doing miracles. She didn't know anything about tongues. We might have heard a little bit about it. We were all new in our faith. We were being baptized. I remember, I think it was uh, uh, Bob Leach... And I think it was Paul Greer, I'm not sure. I think that's who it was, baptizing all of us. Nancy goes under the water and she comes up. Boy, she's just speaking in tongues. And I mean, Nancy's this real conservative person. And she's been speaking in tongues ever since. If she's here, I'd make her get up and testify. But she's at a class reunion. Folks, listen. It... it, it, it if you come to God for anything you need, and folks, I'm telling you, this is the need of the hour. This is the church. If you want in on the Great Reset, let me tell you, the, the true church is about to go forward. And you, you want to get in on it. I mean, God's about to put the pedal to the metal. 
You want to be one of those people who has your vessel full, like we talked about a few weeks ago. This is, this is, a, this is another, what, what being baptized with the Holy Spirit, having your lamp full of oil when Jesus comes. It's going to be necessary. Keep your lamp full. Keep your vessel full. But you're coming to Jesus and you come like a little child. I'm going to ask all of us to stand this morning. And I, we're, we're really not going to embarrass anyone this morning. I'm not going to do that. Um, but we're going to pray a prayer. And if you want to pray along, we're going to ask God to baptize us in the Holy Spirit. Okay? Okay? And let me tell you what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to be available after this service. My wife and I are going to be here. Uh, and Sandra's going to be here and others. Um, and we're going to pray for you. Our prayer team will be here. Those who are designated to be here today. I hope they came ready to pray for you. But I'm going to be here. And we're going to believe God for this. Because we're going to go forward as a church and we want everybody... We don't, we don't care where you've been or what you've been doing. We want you in on this reset. And God wants you in on it. But you've got to have the power to move with the church. Amen? So if you're ready, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to pray a simple prayer. And you just repeat after me. And let me, let me just say, if anywhere along the way you just feel like God's letting your prayer language bubble up, you won't let it come out, just let it come out. Just You know, you kind of want to stay right there with you and you don't want to be distracting to others. I saw a few of you get nervous like relax y'all ready to pray come on maybe you want to lift your hands I know some of you don't feel comfortable doing that how many of you know this is a sign Lord I, I, I want all you got you don't have to raise your hands here again but if you feel ready to do that it's not necessary but just pray along with me let's Let's pray this way. Lord, oh, y'all are praying very timid. Tell me there's more people than that praying with me. Say, Lord, you gave the Holy Spirit to the church to help us fulfill the Great Commission. I ask you in faith for this free gift. And I receive it now. The baptism with the Holy Spirit and I believe that you hear me as I pray I thank you for baptizing me with the Holy Spirit and with the evidence of speaking with a new supernatural prayer language Amen now listen I don't want to move along too quickly. I want to give some of you just a moment quietly where you're at. I know this is a little different setting than some of you are used to. But I think we ought to just take a moment. And just you sit there for just a moment and worship the Lord. And give Him some praise this morning. And why don't, why don't you, if, if God says, all right, now's the time, let, let's, let's vocalize it. Why don't we just take just a few moments and do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, just take a few moments. I want, let, 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 I want to hear you pray, and even if you're praying in English, so let's, let's stir our hearts this morning. Give God some praise for what He has done and what He is going to do in your life. Thank Him for this new day and this new hour that we're coming into. Thank God for this great reset. I'm going to give you just a, just a moment there. If you want to pray in your prayer language, you just go ahead. Come on now, everybody. They did this in the upper room, and this is the sign of believers. Some of you, some of you, don't be intimidated. You need to release this. You don't need to be offended. You don't need to be grieved. You need to release your prayer language right now. Those of you who have been doing this for years, go ahead and pray this morning. We're, we're, we're in the upper room now, and we are praying for God's release. Don't be afraid. Come on, I want to hear you praying. Lord, we give you praise and honor this morning. Father, I pray that all fear will go. God, we will receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit of God. And, and Father, we will realize that, 
Uh, we got to be like a little child. We, Lord, I pray this morning that we will say no to that part of our brain that has pride in it. I hear some of you. Come on, keep it up. Lord, we give you praise and honor this morning. We give you praise. And we bless you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Now, now, some of you could hear people praying with their prayer language. We didn't do that to put on a show or do anything. I just wanted you to hear what it's like. And I'm going to encourage some of you to do what I did. I, I heard this truth. And I struggled a lot longer than I needed to. I lived, I was single, lived out here seven miles north of town. And God had miraculously saved me. And doing a lot of miracles in my life and I'd go sit on the edge of my bed for about six months Lord I'm ready to pray in my prayer language nothing would happen you know why it's a decision you know what I'm going to pray in tongues right now so say <laughs> I'm not trying to put on a show I'm trying to tell you and I'm trying to get a release in this church this church I'm telling you I'm going to interpret that now somebody say you're supposed to have an interpretation this church will never come to the place and the blessing that it needs to be until this congregation as a whole as one surrenders to the Holy Spirit of God and the baptism Come on, everybody. Everybody, now, listen, we're not trying to hurt anybody's feelings. We, we're really not. Uh, but I want everybody that prays with their prayer language, I want us to do that right now in Jesus' name. I hear the Lord saying this is what Joel spoke of in Joel chapter 2. I hear the Lord saying this is what we see fulfilled in our Bibles in Acts chapter 2. Oh, this is of me. Don't be afraid, little children. It is my good pleasure to give you these gifts. Lord, we love you. And we praise you and we worship you. And we honor you in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that every person within the sound of my voice will loosen their tongue and they'll give it to you in the name of Jesus. Now let me tell you what we're going to do, folks. I'm going to give some more teaching on this on Wednesday nights. In fact, did you know there are 21 reasons in the Bible why Christians should pray in tongues? Did you know that? I'm going to start a teaching this Wednesday night by Gordon and Frieda Lindsay, the late Gordon and Frieda Lindsay, the founders of Christ for the Nations. I'm going to share 21 reasons with you why Christians should speak in other tongues. Folks, this may seem trivial to you. It may seem like, oh, I don't know about all this. Yeah, you need it. We're coming into the last day. Some say the last of the last days. What did Jesus say is the number, thing, number, number one thing you need to watch out for? is deception. You need to be sharp in God, and you need everything God has got for you. Also, let me, some of you need a little more teaching, a little more training. I found some books. These are no longer... By the way, none of these... Because the church has gotten away for this, none of these are in print anymore. Anymore. They're out of print. All the books that we were brought up on are out of print now. You know why? Because it's uncool in the church. Even the charismatic preachers are ashamed to preach it on a Sunday morning. Shame on them. Get to preaching this stuff. Here's a little booklet called A Scriptural Outline of the Baptism of the Holy Spirit by George and Harriet Gillies. This, this is just a scriptural outline. Get these scriptures, look them up. Some of them are here, some of them are just there in the scripture. Folks, get educated right now. God is moving. God is on the move. And I'm telling you, I do believe He's up to something new. Let's get in on it, but let's understand we can't go half prepared. And I want something more than we are currently seeing in the body of Christ. Amen. I want to say congratulations, first of all, to all of you who have given your heart so far in this series to Christ. 
And I, I know we've had a, several people say, it's time for me to be water baptized. I've received Christ, and I want to be water baptized. Why don't you go today, as, as immediately after this service, there's a sign-up list. We'll get you the date. We'll get you some information. Also, if you need additional information regarding the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we have an entire class in Finding the Rock. It's called Finding the Rock 501. All you have to do is go to our webpage, go to the uh, FTR, which stands for Finding the Rock page, scroll all the way down to 501, grab your notes. There's some notes that you'll want uh, in the foyer today. We've got them there, and we'll uh, get make sure you get those. And, and find out if what we're saying is the truth. Check script. Be, be, be like those in the Bible. It says they search to find out if everything that was said is the truth. Don't believe what somebody told you in the past. Don't believe some preacher. Believe the Bible. Amen? I've talked all I want to talk. One final thing before we go, folks. Uh, let me just say, if you do need prayer today, we'll have some folks here. I'm going to be around. And let me say, on Wednesday nights, we'll be here after, after, after Wednesday night service. We'll save a little time. You have questions? You have comments? Um, you need prayer? We'll be here to do that. We'll, we'll teach you some of these things. I, I want to say this before we go. I'm going to encourage you as strongly as I know how. Do not miss the next phase of this series. I'm going to talk to you about knowing your enemy. I, I said this earlier. 50% of Christians in America today no longer believe in the devil. There's a devil, and he's real, and there are demons, and you don't have to be afraid of them unless... You out there messing around, playing games, and messing with stuff the Bible says don't do. You are subject to being opened up to them. The devil is real. And this part of this series is not going to scare you. It's going to enlighten you. And again, it's part of the equipment you need to be a victorious believer. And I'm probably going to spend about three weeks on it. You need it. And I'm going to be here, and I'm going to be giving it out to you. But, but we're moving forward, amen. And we, we know who, we're going to know who our enemy is, and we're going to know the authority we have over here. I'm tired of the church being whipped and beat up because they don't know who, who, uh, who the devil is, and they don't know how to defeat him. Jesus conquered the devil for us. And we're seated in heavenly places far above him. Every day we go around just like, uh, just whining. God doesn't want us whining. All right, I've talked enough. Can I talk one more time? No, I'm through. Father, lead us and guide us now as we go forward into this week. And I pray the blessing of the Holy Spirit go with all of us in Jesus' name. God bless. We'll see you next.